Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Plays Number no. 1 by Alan Bennett. So this contains 40 years on, getting on, habeas corpus, and enjoy. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. Um, this is actually really weird the way this is done, so, I mean, I guess I'll read it, but it doesn't necessarily, well, a lot of these are quote so we've got 40 years on Alan Bennett's most gloriously funny play a brilliant youthful perception of a nation in decline as seen through the eyes of a homegrown school play a classic the Daily Mail Ugh. getting on winner of the evening standard best comedy award in 1971 getting on is an account of a middle-aged labor MP so self-absorbed that he remains blind to the fact that his wife is having an affair with the handyman his mother-in-law is dying his son is getting ready to leave home his best friend thinks him a fool and that to everyone who comes into contact with him he is a self-esteeming joke habeas corpus after two elegaic comedies about the decline of old England mr. Bennett has now written a gorgeously vulgar but densely plotted farce that is a downright celebration of sex and the human body a combination of hurtling action with verbal brilliance the Guardian and then enjoy enjoy uncannily foresaw the attitudes to english working class life now now enshrined in theme parks the classic tug in bennett between childhood yorkshire and intellectual sophistication has never been better or more daringly expressed that's from the observer so let's go through and have a look at a few tabs so I started something with an introduction here so the introduction the first paragraph in this did make me chuckle he says, in 1969, I had a letter from a producer in BBC Radio saying he'd fished out an old script of mine from the pool and thought it might have possibilities for a radio play. I liked the idea of a producer at Portland Place dredging up drama from a pool of old paperwork, but he was six months too late, and I smugly wrote back to point out that the play in question, 40 years on, was already running in the West End. And this idea again of this museum or whatever is covered in the introduction. Um, he goes, There was the proposal, later abandoned, to reconstruct part of the Death Railway in Thailand as a tourist attraction. Most pertinent of all, and of course this is the cutting I have lost so we all have to take my word for it, was the devoted reproduction in a museum somewhere in England of the last of the prefabs, with a couple who had lived in it doing a regular stint as curators. He also says, I recently took a child to see the wind in the willows. He first of all asked how long it was likely to ask, and then, how many of there are those things that when they let you out for a bit? Intervals, just one. Oh, those are the bits I like best. So, we're going to start with 40 years on, and obviously with it being a play, um, most of the highlights that I want to share with you guys are, um, you know, just lines of dialogue, essentially. So we get this little bit of dialogue here. So Franklin says, you touch that switch again, Crabtree, and I'll flay the bloody hide off you. What will I do? Crabtree over the microphone, flay the bloody hide off me, sir. Right. And then the headmaster goes, and don't swear, boy, it shows a lack of vocabulary. And so this is the one that's uh, play within a play, which I thought was a really cool kind of literary uh, advice, uh, device and advice, why not? So we get Gerald says, and she's very old fashioned besides, and Lady D replies, if by that you mean she dresses like her mother, yes, she is. But then all women dress like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man ever does. That is his. I like that. That was good. And we get this bit between a boy and his nanny. Can I have an apple? No, you can't. Apples at this time of night. Apples don't grow on trees, you know. And so here from the lectern during this play, because it's sort of set during the wars, so we get somebody reading this out. June 1914. Osbert Sitwell visits a palmist. Nearly all my brother officers of my own age had been two or three months earlier in that year of 1914 to see a celebrated palmist of the period, whom, I remember, it was said, with what justification I am unaware, Winston Churchill used to consult. My friends, of course, used to visit her in the hope of being told that their love affairs would prosper, when they would marry or the direction in which their later careers would develop. In each instance, it appears the chiromant had begun to read their fortunes, when in sudden bewilderment, she had thrown the outstretched hand away from her, crying, I don't understand it, it's the same thing again. After two or three months, the line of life stopped short and I can read nothing. To each individual to whom it was said this seemed merely an excuse she had improvised for her failure, but when I was told by four or five persons of the same experience, I wondered what it could pretend. And obviously they all went off to war. We get this quote saying, Why is it always the intelligent people who are socialists? Um, I consider myself a socialist. The nurse, he says, you make a better door than a window, and I say to that to Biggie all the time when he's getting in the way. And we get a lot of references to Speak for England, Arthur, which is when uh, Arthur Greenwood, the acting Labour leader, rose to speak, and Amory shouted that from the Conservative benches. Um, but I found that interesting because it's quoted in Peep Show, and I'd never known until now that was where, where that came from. But yes, yeah, so that was 40 years on, and as I say, the main thing I enjoyed about that was the play within the play, although I also like, you know, historical stuff and anything to do with the war, really. So moving on to Getting On. So there's a reference to uh, Captain Oates. 
He was an electrician who came to do the bathroom. One day he went off saying, I'm just going out, I may be quite a time. And he never came back. This is a reference to someone who went with uh, Captain Scott on the expedition to the North Pole or the South Pole. If Kaz from Cats of Camera is watching, she'll, uh, she'll correct me because she knows about polar exploration much more than I do. I love this little exchange between Polly and Jeff. So Polly goes, do you live with someone? I mean, not live with, live with. I mean, and Jeff says, yes, in Notting Hill. We have this house. It's owned by some anarchists. I suppose it's a sort of commune, really. We're always borrowing each other's butter anyway. We started off trying to set up a small anarchist community, but people wouldn't obey the rules. Great little gag. And Polly says, education with socialists. It's like sex, all right, so long as you don't have to pay for it. And we get this interesting little example of the way that linguistics can be very subtly affecting the way we think. There you are, you see, my tailor, my doctor, my dentist, your servants. With me, it's the tailor, the doctor, the dentist. They're not mine, and I'm not theirs. And yet, I would always say my tattoo artist. But I, I just mean the person who did my tattoos. And Polly goes, George's trouble is he's a socialist, but he doesn't like people. And Brian says, nor do I much. And Polly says, you're a conservative, you don't have to. And I thought that hits the nail on the head there. And Brian goes, do you think Oxfam ever return anything? Oxfam graciously acknowledges the receipt of your gift, but feel they must return this pair of old knickers as they would only aggravate the situation. Um, well, I know Charlie, Charles Heathcote here on YouTube, he, uh, he works at a charity shop. And I imagine they throw a lot in the bin. Um, or they turn it into rags and stuff. And um, a dog goes for a piss on someone's doorstep and Mrs. Brodrib goes, he's leaving a message, a sign, a note. And George goes, a message, is it? Then I wish he wasn't quite such a frequent correspondent. And this made me chuckle as well as somebody who has a lot of tooth issues. Polly goes, why is it only teeth that decay? And George says, it isn't. And Polly says, you don't always have to go to the doctors to have holes in your arms stopped up, do you? Or your legs filled. It's a flaw in the design. Well, that implies that they were designed. And George here, he goes, you are 32. You are rapidly approaching the age when your body, whether it embarrasses you or not, begins to embarrass other people. I'm 32. But yeah, getting on, a lot of fun. Um, again, from that, it was mostly the dialogue that stood out to me. And then we have habeas corpus. And I didn't really tab too much. One thing I did tag, tag here. I had just arrived in the colonies when I found out I was P-R-E-G-N-A-N-T. And then Throbbing goes, P-R-A-G-N-A-N-T. And Mrs. Wicksteed goes, Pegna. And it just reminded me of those videos where it's like, You're pregnant. Am I pregnant? And we get this great line in this as well. Mrs. Swab goes, That's a refreshing change. The first time this evening everyone has had their trousers on. Then stage direction, Enter Purdue without trousers. I might have known. Where are your trousers? But that's all I tabbed from that one. That one was a 3.5 out of 5. The first two were 4 out of 5 for me. And then we have Enjoy, and this was another 4 out of 5. Linda goes, Love, you're always on about love. I don't want love. I want consumer goods. And Linda, uh, she's the daughter of this family, and she's talking about getting married in Saudi Arabia. She goes, uh, we're getting married this afternoon, at least the civil ceremony. When we get to Saudi Arabia, they have the religious ceremony where they slit the throat of a goat. And the mam goes, a goat? Oh. We've always been Church of England. Still, it's nice when they believe anything at all these days. And then Dad, he has a little monologue. It actually goes on for some time, so I'm just going to read the first page of this. The phrase, no love lost, has always puzzled me. Is in the sentence, there was no love lost between me and her. What does that mean? Does it mean that the love between the person's concern was so precious they could not bear to spill a single drop? And thus, no love went to waste? Taking love as some kind of liquid? I'm thinking of me and Linda. Or does no love lost mean there was no love? None whatsoever. He didn't waste any love on her or she on him. So Don was lost and they both hung on to their quota. And butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. What the fuck does that mean? Somebody could be sat there looking as if butter wouldn't melt in her mouth and I wouldn't recognise it. I should miss it. And daddy goes, I don't want to see no book, a lad of your age. You ought to be outside playing football instead of stuck inside reading books. Well, I prefer to read books than play football, mate. Uh, and then we think the dad, Wilf, we think he might be dead. And the mum goes, Wilf, Wilf. He never used to call me by name. Never Connie, always mam. Never my name, except one stage when he used to call it out when ejaculating. Nice. And Mrs. Clegg goes, good God and rhubarb, what's that? Oh, Connie. Um, and that's because he has an erection and they think he's dead. And they're not sure whether he is actually still alive or that's just the side effect of death. Um, but that also reminded me of my uh, friend and one of my colleagues from one of my clients, Jana, who uh, she goes, good gravy. Oh, and then ma'am later on, she points and goes, it's gone, look, it's gone. Oh, Terry, it must have just been his way of saying goodbye. And then it has quite a sad ending, um, which I'm not going to spoil here. But yeah, that was a solid 4 out of 5 as well. So overall, plays by Alan Bennett. I gave the whole collection a 4 out of 5. I think in order of my favourites, it was 40 years on, then enjoy, then getting on, then habeas corpus. Um, but yeah, did enjoy, pun intended. And I'm looking forward to reading some more Alan Bennett. 
So there we go, that's what I made of Plays Number 1 by Alan Bennett. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.